Hello, and welcome back to Movie Husbands. Today we are reviewing The Zone of Interest. Directed by Jonathan Glazer, The Zone of Interest follows Auschwitz Commandant Rudolf Haas and his wife as they strive to build a dream life next to the camp. It stars Sandra Huller and Christian Friedel in the lead roles. So before we get into today's review, this conversation, since the film is about the Holocaust, does have a lot of references to things that happened in the Holocaust. In case you are sensitive to these subject areas, you might not want to watch. And you might not want to watch the film, to be honest. So with that said, Jeffrey, what do you think about The Zone of Interest? Gosh, so Jonathan Glazer. Talk about a filmmaker who's really important to me, right? He's made about four films in 25 years. Seems to be the main joke of the Q&A that we went to uh, at the New York <laughs> Film Festival. It was. I think the thing that I've always liked so much about Glazer is that he pushes himself considerably. Each one of his films is so utterly different from the last, not only in tone, but in the way that it's filmed. So I know that you've seen Under the Skin. Mm -hmm. Think about the way that Under the Skin is filmed versus the film that we just saw with The Zone of Interest utterly different, right? A lot of it is handheld. Some of it is quite elegantly shot and very still. Some of it is very gorilla-esque and very unwieldy. I think Glazer in particular, when he takes so long with his work, it's because he's really fine tuning all these different aspects of it. Having seen the Q&A and, and him talking about the film, he doesn't strike me as somebody that makes a lot of mistakes or leaves things in that he, he doesn't intend to be there. And I found the zone of interest to be very much of the same vein. It's a film that feels perfectly manicured in so many ways. It's a film that's very disturbing. He's a filmmaker that has always been drawn to darker subject matter. But at the same time, his films have never been as overtly thematic as this film has. Even Under the Skin, I think, is a parable in many ways, and it's an abstract parable. It's a parable where the imagery is a lot more important than what's on the page. However, you have to have a long conversation and extrapolate a lot of symbolism from that film in order to get what it's going for. Whereas I think, at least on the surface level, the subtext of Zone of Interest is actually quite obvious. There's a lot more going on in this film than just the banality of evil. There's many, many things that we'll talk about that I think it's doing that are very interesting. But at the same time, he's never been a very didactic filmmaker. And I think that this film is as impressive or maybe more impressive than anything he's ever made. But at the same time, I've never seen him have something to say the same way that he did in this film. So you had mentioned the Q&A because we did see this at the New York Film Festival. And one of the other things that I remember from that Q&A in particular was that this film is based loosely, very loosely on the book by Martin Amis, also called The Zone of Interest. And he had mentioned during the Q&A how the perspective is really shifted from, I think, somebody in Auschwitz to a family and one of the commandants that actually worked in Auschwitz. I could see how some people might find this take to be off-putting or somewhat offensive, but I do find it to be very intriguing and very interesting and, and worth discussing because it is perspective you don't normally see in Holocaust movies. And what that leads to in this movie is something that is extremely cold. The way this movie opens is very interesting, and I want to start there because it's very much an audible experience. So you're listening to voices and sounds. At first, I wasn't really sure about this scene. I thought it was lasting way too long. Felt like it was lasting for like three or five minutes. It felt like a very long time. Yeah, I, I think I read that it was three minutes. Yeah, and it was just a black screen and it was just sound. I felt like our senses were being rearranged to understand where we were going with the movie. And I really did appreciate that later on because there were things that I noticed that I don't know if I would have noticed without that intro scene. Jonathan Glazer had mentioned during the Q&A that this movie is almost two movies in itself. It's the movie that you here and it's the movie that you see. I do think there is also a sense of a third movie in my head maybe. With what you see and what you hear, you can imagine a third movie playing on the other side of this wall. It's a very ominous mm -hmm. wall that's being paid attention to a lot in this movie. It's very interesting how many plants, there's a pool, there are lavish gardens with vining roses by the wall. There are areas where you can sit and-, and we get a very extensive tour of it. And we get a point. very yeah. extensive tour. The only tour. time the camera moves. Yeah, yeah, there's a greenhouse which plays a role later in the movie, the wall was always just this ominous presence that was there. It was cold, it was concrete, it had barbed water on the top. It was one of the first things I noticed that stood out from these lavish gardens. The camera doesn't do anything very fancy in this film. It either stays very still, or I believe there's one or two tracking shots that follow the horizontal line. It just goes from one side to yeah, the other. He has an amazing talent with composition with the shots, but the shots don't move for yeah. the most part. Yeah, and I think that is just something that enhances the subject matter 
in the seriousness of it, also the coldness of the characters, that you were not going to get anything from this movie that is outside of the realm of what it's supposed to be telling us. Going back to the filming style a little bit, I think the film keeps us at a distance with the camera because the main characters keep a distance from the atrocities that are happening from the wall. And the way the film tackles the subject matter is very delicate because I think Glazer is asking us to take the words that he said in the Q&A to think about what you may have in common with them, which is not the same thing as empathizing or identifying. Mm. It's saying these people are, are wholly bad. And in what ways in our modern culture do you replicate some of that badness? The film is trying to mirror a lot of what's happening in our society and say how in many ways these same things, perhaps in less obvious circumstances, persist. And I found that really disturbing. <laughs> it was really hard to get it out of my brain with all the other movies that we saw, all of the imagery and just the, the sheer power of it. What's so interesting about it is you're watching it and it's a fairly boring film in, in many ways because it's you're really just watching people live their lives. And if that wall of Auschwitz wasn't there, this would be a tremendously boring film, actually, in many ways. I don't think I realized the power of it until um, the very end. And we'll we'll get to a spoiler section and we'll get to an analysis section where we could talk about the end in more detail. But if you go to see this film and you're kind of wondering and it makes you uncomfortable or something, I, I don't know. There's something about the cumulative power of this film, image after image after image that you're interpreting that just kind of falls on you by the end and you, you just feel very heavy. Yeah, this movie normally would just be a family in a house having conversations. There's an argument at one point that takes place over his possible transfer. Mm -hmm. All these things have a different meaning because they take place on the other side of this concentration camp. I guess at this time, if you have not seen The Zone of Interest, please go see it, but we are gonna get quite a bit deeper and, and talk about things um, and give kind of some strong analysis of things that happen later in the film. So please bookmark this and come back once you've seen it. I really want to go back to this audible experience that this mm -hmm. movie had because there are so many details of things you hear in the background that allude to what's happening on the other side of the wall. One of the earliest things in this movie, Sandra Holler's character, uh, Mrs. Haas, she brings in a mink coat. Mm -hmm. She's trying it on and immediately I'm like, where does, you know, this mink coat, I know where I came from. Yeah. And it's very sad and disturbing. But she is trying on this mink coat and a vial of lipstick pops out and lands on the floor. And she goes to try it and she's actually putting it on her lips. It's very disturbing. And in the background, almost too faint to hear in the very distance, I heard a couple of pops. Oh. And this was one of the first experiences I had is the detail of things that you hear in the background. And that was so disturbing to me. I think immediately preceding that scene too, she has this this very cold sequence where she just dumps a bunch of clothes onto the kitchen table. Yeah. And she just tells the servants, oh, take what you want, take one of each, whatever. And that was before the film had really gotten going. And there's, there's innumerable examples of this. Going back to, to sound, there's a scene later where one of the other children is playing with soldiers on the ground and he overhears a prisoner being punished. Do you remember this? He says, yeah. I forget what it was. He stole food or something of, of the sort. And the guard yells to go drown him in the river. And we don't we don't hear the drowning, but we hear some aftermath of that. And, and also, we... just to jump in for there, the kid walks up to the window and he takes a quick look. And then afterwards, I can't tell if he's chiding himself or the Jewish person. I think he's embodying a future Nazi guard. And he says something like, you better not do that again. I can't uh, okay. remember exactly what he says, yeah, yeah. but it seems to be that he's quite obviously taking all the wrong lessons from hearing that. Yeah. But that's just a couple examples of, of I think, the this auditory film that's happening. You know, if we only had the visual aspects of this film, it would be like Gene Dealman or something. It would just be people around their house, like making tea and buttering bread and all these things. And the sound is really what brings this film to a, a much more disturbing level. And a lot of the sounds are about opposites. You hear things like birds chirping and insect noises and beautiful rivers running. And then you hear gunshots, you hear fire, you hear people screaming. So there's something here about the lovely and natural aspect of the natural world versus all of the horror that we bring to it as human beings. There's this really amazing image that is only like five seconds of the film that 
some of the ashes of the bodies that are being burned or being tilled into the garden. Yes. So it's almost like the the beautiful garden they have is built on the dead bodies of all of the people that they're ignoring. Very fascinating and horrifying image. And sometimes a lot of those sounds are, are colliding with each other. You're going to hear birds chirping at the same time that you're hearing people dying. There was a particular scene that I noticed that in that didn't really have the audible aspect, but the father gets a canoe or something for his birthday and he takes two of his children out. Mm-hmm. And they're swimming mm. in the water and mm-hmm. he is fishing and all of a sudden some bones wash up into his hands and he immediately gets the kids out of the water. But that was one of those aspects where the environmental beauty of the world was being ruined by humanity. Yeah, and, and there was, was a horrible violence. And as you notice, there's like an ash. Do you see the ashes? Yeah. Yeah. So the ashes start coming up the river and it's a quite a clear distinction between the river and the ash portion of the river. Of course, they're the ones, or I, I would say mostly the husband, that they're, they're at least complicit in these atrocities happening. And what's the first thing they do is they take their children and they wash all of the atrocities off of their children. This one scene that I found um, really interesting, which is there's a couple close-ups of flowers before the screen starts flashing red. The only thing I could think of is I connected it to a scene later in the film that's a scene of, of really horrid beauty, which is when the mother-in-law is looking out of the window and the entire room that she's staying in lights up red because they're burning bodies yeah. at night. By the way, mother-in-law, a very interesting part of the film yeah. that is very mysterious because the mother-in-law just takes off one night without telling anybody, leaves a note for Sandra Huller's character. It's never said what the note says or it's never explained in any way. So I, I wonder if she left because she was... Oh, I think she was clearly affected by what was happening because yeah. I remember she woke up that one night that we saw the red outside the window yeah. and she looked out the window and she was so physically affected. Mm-hmm. She wasn't acting like everybody else in the household. Mm-hmm. Her body language was completely different. Mm-hmm. And so when she left that next day and she had left that note, I felt like I didn't have to read the note. Mm-hmm. I felt like I knew in some way what it had said and also the way that Mrs. Haas just tossed it. I took that as a metaphor for what the note actually said. A metaphor of like repression in a way. Well, I took it both as like uh, understanding of what the note said. And I also took it as a metaphor for how she treats people that might not feel comfortable knowing what's happening Mm -hmm. and might have something to say about it. She basically just discarded it like it was nothing. So I want to talk about some symbols in the film. So we get these these interspersed infrared sequences of what we can only assume or is maybe somewhat confirmed is a Jewish girl gathering apples and seemingly leaving them at work sites for Jewish people who are in the camp. And obviously, the first thing you think of was with an apple is Adam and Eve. You think of the origin of sin. Certainly, the, the Nazis are committing sins. And I think that the apple is a, is kind of evoking that. I noticed that it, in particular, there was also this class divide. There were people that were working on the, at the house. And yes, there were the people doing that, taking care of the gardens. I also noticed this one scene where Mr. Haas comes back, but he has some people with him. When he gets there, he takes off his boots. The other men ask, should they take off their shoes too? And he's like, no, don't worry about it. And he leaves them next to the door. And then what you see after everybody's disappeared is this man comes through. He takes the boots and he goes around to the side and he just starts cleaning them. In my head, I was just like, oh, that's why he told everybody they didn't have to take off the boots because he knew in his head that somebody was going to come and take them and clean them. Part of that class divide, I feel like, was very present in the movie. This is very much a film about what people ignore what people don't say, what people just let happen. Yeah, and in that same spot later in the film, one of the sons is making out with some other person. So it's almost like he's having these youthful experiences that we all have, but yet right over the wall, those experiences are being, you know, evaporated forever. I want to talk a little bit about the business aspects of this film, which I found even more disturbing. Our main character, Rudolf Haas, has to sit through a presentation about a new furnace and gas chamber system that's being pitched to him the same way that somebody would come in your house and pitch to you a nice new dishwasher. It's crazy. Mm. And they talk about the efficiency of which people are gassed and then burned and then all of the ash is excavated from the scene. And they're talking about it with the efficiency that the same way that you talk about the efficiency of one of the appliances in your house. And later in the film, he's transferred and he's sitting at a table with all of these different high ranking Nazi officials. And they talk about things like incentives. I work in marketing, so I I often write incentives for a sales force. And I know that this was true. And I know that there was a complex system to the Nazi regime. But to think that 
the business sense of having sales incentives to kill people faster was part of the whole regime is, is just, it's horrifying. In our education, we talk so much about the victims of, of the Holocaust, and rightfully so, that we don't often talk about how it occurred in the first place. But at the same time, this film asks those questions and asks, how does this function on mm. a business level? How does this function on a practical level? Yeah, it makes you question a lot. <laughs> yeah. Things that occur or happen and people just let go and you just wonder like, where yeah. can these same things lead down the line? As evocative as this movie is, I think it's a film that illuminates a lot of how these things occur. And I think they're things, they're very serious things that we need to pay attention to because if you just don't pay attention, they can build up into something that contributes to something like a genocide. The more we talk about it, I'm just like, the details, the details are absolutely insane. There was another moment that I noticed very particularly where two of the sons are playing in the gardens and the older one locks the younger yeah, one. I didn't know into, what to make of that. You were talking earlier about how the kid was looking outside the window and he's learning to follow mm. the footsteps of his parents. This was one of those scenes where I noticed that he locked the younger, his younger brother in the greenhouse who was very upset, but you know, the scene never plays out. It cuts from there and just goes to something else. But you know that kid's coming out of there. Mm -hmm. This greenhouse is right up against this wall. And just knowing what's happening on the other side, you could just imagine what's seemingly a playful expression for these two brothers. But on the other side of the wall, this is real, this is reality, and these people are never getting out. I found that scene to be a comparative look at what is happening just on the other side of the wall, very much as so much of this movie is in the details. I think it's time to skip to the end of the film, which I feel like I need to talk about. So towards the end of the film, there is a flash forward where we go to modern day Auschwitz. And we, seemingly the same hallway that our main character was just in. Yes, there's all these representations of, of atrocity, right? We see hundreds of shoes, we see all these different burned up chairs, we see all these backpacks, all these things that belong to all of these people that are, are now like disappeared from existence, right? And we see people nonchalantly cleaning Auschwitz and we see people vacuuming rugs and, and cleaning windows and etc. It's interspersed with these two scenes of it's the same scene it's just broken up of our main character walking down the hallway and he starts to retch a little bit he starts to almost feel like he's gonna throw up yeah and then he goes and he walks down he feels like he's gonna throw up again and then he just walks into the darkness and the film ends and you had an amazing observation about this that i i didn't realize or put together myself is that in many ways and kind of what i was saying before that we we tend to talk a lot about the victims and all the evidence of the victims is in this very bright light whereas him the perpetrator is walking into the darkness almost like the darkness of history that we're going mm. to forget about the things he did and how he got to the place that he was at which is very interesting because that correlates to the darkness of the opening of the film which is just three minutes of pummeling noise mm. that almost is the darkness of history like we're going through time back to what was what actually happened so that we can observe it for ourselves this is a very bold move i think in this film because you're in a certain headspace throughout it and to just flash forward to modern day Auschwitz, it takes you out of the film, I think, in a, in a very effective way. It's a film, I think, that in many ways is much more about what it means. And this imagery is meant to convey a certain feeling. And this does the same thing. It just takes you out of the time period you're in. So I was very curious what you thought of that. Him walking into that darkness was almost like history was forgetting about him in a way that we don't, I think, have to memorialize, obviously, but I think it's important to realize that these people existed, understanding how they got to the place that they did so that we can not repeat history. And I think that's maybe one of the lessons that the movie has to teach us is that, yeah, we don't need to lift these people up on a pedestal because they did horrible, horrible things, but we do need to understand these people to a certain degree because we need to watch out for them because yeah. these people don't just disappear. They still exist. I mean, we have freaking Nazis walking around in Florida yeah. with, with flags. We need to keep an understanding of how such people can develop into power and thus create such terrible atrocities. So I do want to talk quickly about the actors in this film because they were completely emotionally impacting for me. Sandra Holler in particular, I think, had such a big weight on her shoulders to reach a place that was so cold and 
unemotional. I noticed it in the way she walked and the way she talked. She sort of struts around the house like somebody who like works out a lot and has like big thighs. Yeah, and she, that's a very good observation. I, 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 and she, she has this habit of something goes a little bit wrong in her life and she has all these servants that she can just boss around. Yeah, there's a particular scene where I don't know if it's a relation to after the mom left, I can't quite remember, mm -hmm. but either after the mom left or her husband transferred out for a short time, there are two plates of food on the dining room table. It was when the mom left. Yeah. And she was like, are you mocking me? Are you trying to do this to me? Yeah. Not understanding that like the mom just left. Like nobody yeah. really knew. There was no way to just make sure the food wasn't there. But she took it out on the servant that was working there. We heard Sandra Holler. She was able to speak at New York Film Festival. And so she was talking during the Q&A about just how cold and how the character herself has no empathy. To live next to this camp and be married to somebody who is working there takes absolutely no empathy. She feels cold towards the character. So it, it, it took her a matter of months before reading the script and talking with Jonathan Glazer extensively before she even agreed to Commit take to on project, this role. Yeah. I guess as a German actor, you know, I can't really put myself in their shoes, but as a German actor, I understand how portraying a Nazi could be multifaceted in a lot of negative ways. So she really didn't want to portray this person because she always approaches her characters with sympathy and says, how do I understand this person? How does this person function? The way she talked about her method was she almost had to remove herself completely from this character and look at it only logically. What would this person do in this situation on a practical level? Yeah, because this is a person you can't feel for. This is the person that doesn't feel. And to some degree, that method fits perfectly with the film because the film is unfeeling in a lot of ways. Uh, well, the film is unfeeling towards those people. Yeah. The film is trying to observe them and show what they're doing. Acting 101 is to find the humanity in this person. How do we find the humanity in this very dark soul, right? And this film and these actors are doing quite the opposite, actually. I think Jonathan Glazer referred to it as anti-drama. He wanted to show a film of anti-drama, of complete mundanity that happens in the face of all of this. Yeah, there's only one scene that seems to be filled with some drama, and that is an argument that takes place between her and Christian Friedel's character, her husband in the film, and he has been told that he is transferring to a different location. And there is a big argument that breaks out because he found out this about a week ago. He was trying to stay. And she is not happy with this at all. She is very happy with her life here. A very weird thing to say. But she does get her wish to stay and just live there while he's been transferred for a little time. But that argument is one of the bigger moments, I would say, of the film from a dramatic perspective. Yeah, and uh, apparently from a behind-the-scenes perspective, the two pages he would give somebody to read before telling them what the film was about, which is really interesting. When you go into the film, you imagine a certain kind of acting, and I'm going to do this for my Oscar scene, and I think the actors are really in service of the film here, and they're very removed. It's it's a very different type of acting than I think that we're used to. Also something that came across in the Q&A that I'm just recalling now, that a lot of these audible sounds that we hear were not used during filming of the movie. Mm -hmm. So all these were done in post. Interesting the context that it has in terms of the child actors that are in this movie, because the children children are basically frolicking through these gardens, playing in the pool, going down a slide. Yeah. It's really, really disturbing. And for them to so nonchalantly just be playing in a pool while people are dying on the other side is so crazy. I've been to the Holocaust Museum. I've seen many Holocaust uh, films. I read Night, which is a memoir by Eli Wiesel, which was a very impactful uh, memoir for me. To see the context of this film and what it has to say from a different perspective it's interesting how disturbed I felt with everything I've seen about the Holocaust already. So you ready to go to grades? I am ready to go to grades. I give The Zone of Interest an A. It's a very deep movie that really moved me in obviously all the worst ways. Uh, it's disturbing. I highly recommend it, I think, from the perspective shift. I think it's something that we haven't really seen in film. The acting performances, the meticulousness of this film you were describing earlier in this review. There is something that Jonathan Glazer is doing here. Even though he doesn't make a film every now and then, and he waits so long to make one, you can tell it's not like he's waiting five years and be like, oh, here's an idea. Yeah. He is thinking of an idea, and he is meticulously working on it with his writers and 
thinking about the actors who can portray these characters. He is working so detailed and so in depth about what this film was going to be. He had so much intention about it. And you could see that throughout this entire movie. I give it an A as well. I think it's hard to contend with the fact that it's a masterwork. I could understand if somebody watched it and they said that it, it offends them because of the way it approaches the subject matter. I, I would completely understand that. I think from a film perspective, something that we ask ourselves a, a lot in regards to, to especially this period in history, is there anything new or anything else to say about the Holocaust? And this is the first film in a very long time that has something new to say. I can't even say like the normal descriptors that I normally would about a film, like that it's beautiful to look at, because it's not. It's a film that is very meticulous and is very carefully composed, but is also carefully composed to elicit a negative reaction from you. I'm really astounded, I think, by the fact that he he put so much into this film and he had something true and thematic to say, which is not always his strong suit, frankly. For as much as I've admired his films, they kind of live in this nether area that are not very didactic or not something that you think about at night. At the same time, I haven't stopped thinking about this film since since I saw it. It's quite an achievement. It's, it's very disturbing. It's a film that's really important to see and very important to reckon with. And I think that you'll have a reaction to it one way or the other. And that is it for our review of The Zone of Interest. The Zone of Interest will be in theaters December 8th. If you've already seen The Zone of Interest, let us know in the comments what do you think about the film. As always, thank you guys for watching and we'll see you next time.